one. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian, for having me today. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit how we are trying to identify the slow growing peaks using birds and winning body weight at birth. Um, and I will explain you why this is important. Um, so I will turn off my video. So I am not interfering there. Okay. So to start with, uh, Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, some facts about the importance of pig production and food security, some basic facts about pig production for some of you that may not be familiar with the topic, and how we can use some principles of machine learning to improve uh, pig production efficiency. So to start with myself, my name is uh, Julia Calderon Diaz, and I was born and raised in San Salvador in El Salvador, which is the smallest country in continental America. In 2002, I moved to Honduras to study my bachelor's in agriculture science at the Pan American School uh, Zamorano. While I was doing my bachelor's degree, I had the chance to go for an internship for four months to Mexico to work with World Vision, which is a, which is a charity trying to improve the livelihood of people in rural communities. Uh, during my internship there, I was training a woman in how to raise sustainably broiler chickens uh, using materials that were available in the community to build uh, the farm and also providing them with technical uh, knowledge. Okay. When I, I finish. So I was just going to ask Julia, and that was for kind of smaller scale production, was it? This wasn't for commercial yeah, yeah. type production. Yeah. Okay, so you've made that transition then really from looking at the world both at a micro and into macro type, bigger farming units, bigger scale production, so on, that, that's part yeah. of your journey. Okay, very, okay. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, once I finished my bachelor's, I went to the United States in 2006 for, to work at the Illinois Natural History Survey in a project about soybean aphids. Soybeans, aphids are a pest, affecting soybeans. And what we did was to track populations to try to predict which um, species was going to be affecting the crops in the next season. And, to, and with that, to try to design strategies to mitigate the damage that these insects will, will do to the crops. Okay. Then into and I was going to, to ask, do we have similar type issues with pests in Europe? Um, I, I mean, the climate and so on is a bit different. Um, but do we, I think you mentioned something to me before, the set of techniques that were used there were quite innovative uh, in terms of controlling for pests. Um, yeah, I, would, I, I wouldn't be sure if, which pest you have here in Europe. I'm sure that crop producers will have similar problems, but it's different, right? Like Europe is not a big producer of soybean. Soy. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it's in another kind of crop, but yeah, they will have some, some issues. Okay, and of course, Illinois and the Midwest is big grain producing country, uh, um, part of the world. So, um, you know, it is in some respects, it's sort of a monoculture or- Yeah, the the, the, they're the grain basket of the United States. Okay. Soybean and corn is, one of the main crops that they will raise their, grow there, at least, you know, when it comes for animal feed. Okay, and it's kind of produced there consistently year after yeah. year after year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so yeah. then once I finished in, at Illinois, I got a scholarship to study uh, my master's degree under the Erasmus Mundus uh, program, which is financed by the European Commission. This was a program in animal breeding and genetics with six university partners uh, that include the Norwegian University of Life Science, the Agricultural University for, from Sweden, or SLU, Wageningen University in the Netherlands, the University of Agriculture and Applied Life, Natural Science in Austria, in Vienna, AgroParitech in France, and the University of Kiel. Okay. So I was going to do, ask you, Julia, is that, was the funding for scholarship uh, your end or how did that work? 
Can you recall? So, it? so what you do is that it, so they form these consortiums, right? In, okay. So imagine now you want an Erasmus Mundus master in machine learning. Okay. Yes. So you con you contact other universities and you create your consortium, and if you get the funding, you know, good luck. So okay. then this is open to people all around the world, and they have two different kinds of scholarships. So they call it like type A and type B. I okay. think type A is the one for non-European nationals. And that will include the full tuition plus the stipend for the okay. students to come to study in Europe. And type B would be the one for Europe and some other countries. And that is pretty much, um, at least in my case, I think they were only covering the tuition and not really giving them a stipend. Okay. I was, I was the first. I was the first class in this master, and we oh. were all non-Europeans. Right. Well, I mean, there is that sense in Europe. It's uh, it, Europe is identifying itself, or it's being unified under kind of these how it communicates to external stakeholders. And uh, of course, Europe has always pioneered a lot of new science, and there's always been these very well established universities. But I suspect in this particular area, in the food science area, this could be quite transformative that you bring people from overseas, maybe for, from lower income parts of the world, you, you know, make, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, in terms of investment, it's, you know, this really ha potentially has a high return on investment because you take people who are uh, skilled, to a certain degree, but then you provide an additional set of skills. Um, and you also, I suppose, expose people to different forms of agriculture. I don't know how uh, your end, you would have sensed that, you know, that experience uh, helped you along. I, maybe you can document it, sir. Well, I, I went, I was never in farms because my master was in quantitative genetics. So I was pretty much doing that analysis. Okay. Right. And and at least uh, where when it comes to animal production, yeah. like intensive animal production, is very standardized around the world. Okay, but you were saying before, I think that poultry production, a lot of the recent progress that's come that end has come based on this kind of genetic. But if you think ev everything you eat at the moment has been somehow improved through genetic selection. Okay. You, you know, including including crops. Now we have high yields, different varieties, let's say tomatoes, right? If you go to supermarket, you find so many different tomatoes that are being produced and, that, and those plants are selected because oh. they have high yield or the taste, you know, like let's say cherry tomatoes taste different from salad tomatoes. Okay. And that is all done through, or has been done through traditional uh, genetic selection, right? Okay. Which include numbers. And I was going to say, it is genetic selection. It's not genetic it's modification. Not, it's not, it's not, no. Okay. This is, we call it the classical genetic methods, right? Because what we have is information on pedigrees. So we know, you know, as many generations as possible for the fathers, grandfathers, great grandparents and so on. And based on that, we can identify animals that are better at certain traits. Okay. And then we can estimate their genetic potential to transfer those characteristics to the next generation. Okay. And, and all is of course now people are using other techniques as genomic selection where the whole genome of the animal will be identified genes that are expressed better or you know they can go to this very in detail okay information for each animal but we are not introducing any organism or making mutations in the genes it's just okay. the information is used in a such a smart way that yes. we can through through and numerical methods okay. select who should be the parent of the next generation to produce animals that grow better, that eat, you know, better, that get less sick, and that have higher welfare standards. It, it sounds a little bit like traditional approaches, but done in a very kind of orchestrated framework. And yeah. It, it, 
it's potential obviously is quite powerful because you know when you're fooling around with new you know uh, in the petri dish you, you're not quite sure what you create whereas this basically is trying to uh, crystallize or manifest improvements in a particular strand that already exists in nature so you're not interfering with mother nature sounds like you're helping mother nature along um, and it's based on um, uh, numerical techniques you're saying so, yep. so that's very interesting uh, I better not hold you up though in terms of um, I mean I paused a bit uh, agonized a little bit on this area because <laughs> I like the European angle but I, I I might be disrupting a bit the flow here. So I know that's, that's fine. Don't okay. worry. Okay. So uh, in this consortium, the coordinators were Wageningen in the Netherlands. So we used to spend the summers there. Okay. And during my first year, I was at the University of Natural Resources and Applied Natural Science in Vienna. And in my second year, I moved to France to study in Agroparitech. And I had the chance to conduct my thesis at INRAE, which is the National Institute of France for Agricultural Research, uh, where I check correlated responses to select for better feed efficiency on reproductive performance of the female pig. Then in 2010, I came to Ireland for the first time to study my PhD, focusing on sow welfare and behavior. I was registered in University College Dublin but I did all my experimental work in Chagas, which is the uh, Agricultural and Food Development Authority here in, in Ireland. Okay. Once I completed, oh, well, in, during the, my time in the PhD, I also had the chance to spend some time in University of Warwick learning to do some more advanced data analysis. Once oh. I finished my PhD, I moved back to the United States, but this time beside Illinois in Iowa to Iowa State University to work in a project about um, feeding replacement females uh, better so they can develop more efficiently and have longer a uh, lifetime in the herd. And in 2015, I decided to come back to Ireland to do a second postdoc in Chagask, this time uh, focusing more in the uh, finisher pigs Okay. Mainly working in the in a project projects related to biosecurity, animal health, and also developing bioeconomic models uh, for the Irish pig uh, sector. Okay, sounds like then uh, you came to Ireland. You experienced the weather, and <laughs> you still came back. So that that's slightly positive. Um, I, I got minus 40 and loads of snow in Iowa. So okay, the rain the, right. the rain was beautiful. <laughs> Yet in Ireland. Light smattering of rain completely something yeah. I yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, go ahead. I, well, I was going to ask you then, uh, you were going to describe then kind of the, so that's a very interesting background. And I think a little bit like we, we see how, you know, the, the logistics behind food production crisscrosses boundaries and jurisdictions, but also um, we see that also from the human end, the people who's, who, who are involved in food production, their training, so on, can actually, in your case, is probably quite unusual in the sense that so many <laughs> jurisdictions in many places <laughs> Uh, and there's uh, obviously we benefit here in Ireland from the expertise that builds up as somebody is sort of formed and they're trained and then to come to Ireland uh, to bring along with them then uh, that set of, of skills but even in terms of how the you know conventionally how food is produced uh, we see that you know Soy is produced in one part of the world, but then which then becomes part of the feed in somewhere in Europe, which then the you know the target the the end product could be the food is produced in Ireland, the you know the the it's consumed maybe in France or in UK and so on. Yeah. So you know we are one of the things that would have emerged very clearly from the pandemic is that this is a global type sphere that we operate in and that. Um, Food production is, uh, uh, in no respect, is any different. It is very globalized, uh, and um, 
the artificial boundaries that you know um, political borders might constitute are really you know they're fictional when it comes to food production yeah uh, you've said a powerpoint you're going to go through a little bit then setting out the optimization the, the how we could apply in a very specific sense uh, machine learning or am i skipping ahead too quickly julia yeah now now i think i want to just give like one oh, brief, over, okay yeah because you know not everybody is familiar i suppose with peak production and why it is important okay so context is important um, yeah yeah. Just, a, you know, like briefly. Okay. Okay. So, according to the United Nations, there will be around 9 billion people by the year 2050, with some other people estimating that can be even higher than this. Um, if people, number of people in the world are increasing, there will also be an increase of demand in animal protein, mainly in emerging economies, because now the, also their economic power of acquiring products is increasing. If we want to be able to supply this high demand in animal protein, we need to start to think in fast growing and feed efficient species, uh, such as pig and poultry, um, because they are, are very likely to account for a major share in the growth that we will need to have in the livestock sector. In fact, Pig and poultry are the major animal protein sources already accounting for 70% 70 70 of the meat globally. And pork is in fact uh, the most widely consumed meat in the world with a share of 36%. Uh, pigs uh, that are feed efficient need less days from birth to slaughter, uh, which translate into more efficient and sustainable production systems. Why? Because more efficient pigs are desirable. They, having them be more efficient will reduce production cost, but also pigs compete with humans for edible energy and protein sources like cereals. Therefore, uh, utilizing less input in, as I said, in our case, cereals for animal feed to produce the same number of kilos of pork can contribute to a better use of resources and also to lower the nitrogen and phosphorus excretions in the, into the environment that are produced on a pig farm. Um, in the world, it's estimated that the pig population is now at 654 million pigs, with the main producers being China, the European Union, the United States, and Brazil. Uh, in Europe, over 75% of pigs are kept in large commercial holdings with high levels of technification, including the use of specialized genetic lines, modern, modern automatic uh, feeding systems, and also some smart farming uh, technologies now being called precision livestock farming to monitor, model, and to also manage animal production. Uh, here and elsewhere, pig producers have to adhere to a strict animal welfare standards, with many countries having a specific legisl legislation in place. Um, and also, we have to ensure high animal health uh, for the pigs in every farm. And to do this, uh, some of the practices will include to having a very detailed animal health management plans and we have to follow a strict biosecurity practices once before we enter and once we enter to the pig farm. One of these is how the animals move along the production stages. In Ireland, pig production is quite important. It's actually the third more important enterprise after dairy and beef in that order. And it represents 8% of the gross agricultural output uh, and it employs directly around 8,300 8, people, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ireland, we have a population of 1.5 million pigs. And out of these, around 151,000 are sows. Sows are important because they are like the engine on a, of a farm. Without the females, we don't have the rest of the pigs. Okay. Uh, yeah. we, ha we have approximately 280 commercial farms. 
mainly concentrated in Cavan, Cork, Tipperary, and Waterford. Uh, on average, a pig farm in Ireland has 497 sows. Mm -hmm. And these are among the largest integrated hair sizes in Europe. In Ireland, it's, it's very particular that we have from bears to slaughter in the same site. Okay. Um, however, uh, our, on average, we are producing 27 pigs per sow per year. But Irish pigs are among the lowest uh, in terms of weight at the point of sale. And this is something particular to the Irish production system, which include uh, that we don't have the practice of castrating males. Okay. And, therefore, and therefore we try to uh, slaughter them earlier to avoid bortain, which is a certain smell and taste that is undesirable when it okay. comes to meat quality. So the males, at a certain age, are, are cold, is, it? is that? Um... And no, it, cold is that we don't eat them. A slaughter okay. is to send them for food purposes. Okay, so they're, they're, trying, they're converted into food at an earlier stage compared to- But at, at an earlier a, a weight. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you were saying they don't castrate here as much? No, Ireland doesn't castrate at all. It's not, it, as far as, I'm, as I know, it's not that it's banned. It was ju it's just not a practice that Irish farmers do, but nobody castrates in the country. Okay. And in the UK is another example in Europe that is, you know, they just decided they don't want to do it, they don't castrate, but it's not, they say it's not an imposition, right? It was yeah. something that they decide to not do. Yeah. A few things occurred to me as you're kind of describing different, uh, as you go into the PowerPoints, one was that um, obviously, uh, when we go into supermarkets, we see just an abundance of food. We don't give much thought to where the food comes from. But actually, there's quite a lot of science involved in getting, you know, producing food and keeping food quite safe. Yeah. Um, and it's very easy that when we, you know, just as consumers, that we assume everything happens uh, automatically. But actually, a lot of thought and a lot of uh, systems have developed and knowledge and expertise have developed. Yeah. Um, and I suppose there's also moved in recent years towards people, you know, I mean, more, more vegan like. And because we see such an abundance of food, uh, we tend to forget there was a time actually when there was very little food or food was scarce or food was um, was rationed. So exactly. people my age, we, we've we always known an abundance of food, but the generation before, going back to my parents and so on, they would speak about times when food actually was scarce. And, you know, in if you go to different parts of the world, I go down to Africa every so often, once every two, three years. And if there's a drought or there's some kind of disruption in terms of how food is produced, um, you know, children go to bed hungry. So, um, and, uh, you know, the solution to that is you, we develop a science where we can secure, uh, you know, the, the way food is produced and we, um, you know, have these biohazards and welfare of the animal and so on is assured. And that's something that takes uh, maybe generations to build up. But yeah. we're close to something here. Obviously, the, the gains that we make and the more people study this area, the more knowledge yeah. is developed here, the more we can deal with things like uh, the environment and the, the carbon emissions and nitrogen and so on. And um, that quick turnaround, you know, you have a certain window to produce animals. If it's a very long window, that can be very wasteful then and can have detrimental environmental environmental effects. It's also, exactly. if you have a very long window, if it takes a very long time to produce an animal in terms of this food production science that we currently have, that's currently in vogue, uh, the animal then, as they get older, uh, the probability of picking up a disease or probability of being injured or rubbing against maybe some metal or something in the where the food has been produced, that also increases. So a lot of this neuroscience and your approach here is actually about improving welfare for the animal at the same, also uh, dealing with environmental issues 
that are necessary uh, in any form of scale production and then also producing a safe product because we know that um, you know there are threats and you have to have secure production because you know I think was it African swine flu uh, African swine fever yeah swine fever I mean it hasn't touched Ireland yet it has touched I think parts of Europe yeah mostly Africa Nigeria places like that they have had instances and it's very difficult once it comes into a particular jurisdiction into a physical space it's actually difficult to get that out and having the type of safety measures and dealing with the biohazards in a very kind of scientific approach I think that might but I, I'm stealing a little bit your thunder here uh, maybe <laughs> let you um, continue uh, Julia because uh, it's more important that uh, we kind of what, what I've tried to do is kind of reconcile a little bit the science with positive outcomes in terms of what we experience in terms of the quality of food is produced also the safety of the food, and then also dealing with the real issue. We don't experience hunger or malnutrition so much in Europe, but it is a real phenomenon in other parts of the world. And this is, yeah. you know, this is in part what this type of science is really set up to, to deal with. In maybe 20 years time, we have another type of protein that we identify as being important, but today uh, the type of meat production, so on, the type of protein that we have the type of technology that we have access to is coming through the form of, you know, beef and poultry and pig meat, dairy, so on. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so trying, you know, to, to explain why it's so important for us to be efficient, right? As you are saying, there are many problems that we can face in pig farms when it comes to trying to be more efficient, many obstacles to overcome, but one, that is very important is body weight variability because we can control maybe what we are feeding the pigs, how we are keeping them in, you know, in the farm. Uh, if it's too hot, we can do something with the, you know, to try to cool down. If it's too cold, we need to increase the heating and so on. But what do we do with something that is intrinsic to the animal? Something that is in it since, since before it was born. So we experience body weight variability for many reasons, but one of them is the increase in litter size. So in the past decades, as we were speaking at the beginning, there has been huge advantage in genetics. And one of the traits that geneticists will focus on is to increase productivity. As we said, less input or more input use, or more output using the same input, okay? So mm -hmm. increasing, lit increasing litter size has contributed to an increased percentage of pigs that are born a little bit smaller. And having a little bit lower birth weight in some pigs will increase body weight variability because now we can have a huge range of animals when it comes to birth weight. So we can have animals that are one kilo or a little bit less and we can have pigs that are born at two, two and a half kilos from the same mother at the same litter. Okay. okay. And why is this important? Because it's estimated that at least 10 to 15% of pigs that are born within a farrowing batch. So a farrowing batch will be a group of females that are having the piglets at the same week. It will be 10 to 15% percent of them will be slow growing pigs. The problem with the slow growing pigs is that usually these pigs experience higher mortality rates because they are so small, they are more prone to catch something and die. Um, and those that survive poses management challenges to in the farm, mostly when we're trying to implement all in all out production system. An all in all out production system refer to the practice to manage pig born in the same batch as a unit. So they will move together throughout the different production stages and they will never be mixed with pigs that are older or younger than them because they have different immune status. Okay. Uh, and this is one of the key principles that we have in biosecurity. So let's say all in all out is the analogous of the social distancing in pigs. 
Okay. Okay. Which is however, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say uh, some of the science that operates in these production units uh, could easily, uh, you know, have many benefits in terms of um, managing, you know, the current crisis uh, that we're dealing with in terms yeah. of spread of disease mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and uh, all in, all out means you're safe, you have the same set of problems with all the animals as opposed to having to tackle problems individually. So I can see how that would uh, improve efficiency. Yeah, so the, only, the problem is that contrary to all in all out, where you know pigs are born this week and they will move together always on time and never be mixed. Uh, some of these slow growing pigs because they are smaller, farmers keep them behind in a hope that they will catch up. And when they hold them back, they are mixed with younger animals and they can be carrier of pathogens. So the older ones can be carrying pathogens because they have different immune status. Uh, this will, of course, increase the likelihood of spreading diseases and that the diseases occur in the farm. And they need, of course, the extra time to reach a slaughter weight, which increase the occupancy of the facilities increase feed costs, and also we are able to produce less pigs per pig space, which decrease the efficiency of the whole production cycle. In previous uh, studies that we did here in Chagas, we observed that the slow growing pigs uh, will be around 10 kilos lighter as a slaughter than pigs that were never delayed from the production cycle that keep moving in the all in all out fashion. And these pigs, will tend to have lower meat quality because of the extra time they spend to, cut, to reach the slaughter weight, mm -hmm. they usually deposit more fat. Uh, okay. And therefore the, the meat is not as good as from their bigger counterpart. We don't want fatty meat. We want lean meat that has enough quality, enough meat, uh, fat sorry, percentage to make it tasty, but not that we are eating fat, right? Yeah. So, what can we do, you know, yeah. to identify these animals? So it will be uh, one of the factors that, as I said, affect the variability are birth and winning body weight. Uh, and then it will be very simple to say, okay, if a pig is born small, it will continue small. If it's born big, it will continue big, but this is not what we have observed. We conducted studies and we saw that some of those small born pigs by winning have acceptable body weights as if they were born big. So they're able to catch up with their bigger counterpart. Mm -hmm. So we have small pigs that have the potential to become big. And we have small pigs that remain small. But what we, I don't know what, okay. So, but we, what we saw is that they are similar in terms of feed efficiency as the bigger one, so they eat, let's say, two kilos to put one kilo of weight to say something, which is similar to what the bigger ones are doing, but they need more time to reach a slaughter. Okay. So is there something that we can do to identify them early in life so we can provide them with adequate management uh, so they can spend that extra time but we are not using the space inefficiently or giving them feed that is not appropriate to their actual need. Okay. So to so do it's that- kind of an optimization. I mean, this is, uh, it's a highly, it's a sort of, so it's quite nuanced. It's not as straightforward if it, the pig hits a certain no. weight. It's actually, there's two or three layers of decision-making that could be introduced here. And then it's kind of an optimization problem that's yeah. being addressed. Okay, so uh, obviously, if it's an optimization problem, then uh, a set of techniques, a little bit like the genetic um, numerical techniques in genetics, maybe there are numerical techniques here coming in from the data science machine learning side that obviously could be helpful. Um, okay. But don't, don't let yeah. me steal the thunder, I'm gonna... <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. Okay, so to do that here in Chagas, we decided to do an experiment. So what did we do? We designed a control study, which means that uh, 
we, we, we just didn't go to a farm and see what we observed. We purposely selected animals and I'll explain you how now. So on a given week, we had 20 sows having piglets and they were farrow around 370 pigs live born. At birth, we gave them an identification number to each of them, a unique number, and we weighed them. We took their birth weight within 24 hours and we also recorded which parity was their mother, so how many pig, how many times she has had piglets, and we collected information on litter of origin. So how many piglets were in the were born in the in, on a given litter, and we also um, recorded uh, the gender of each pig. Then they spent 28 days with their mother. At the point of winning, we weighed them again, and we matched them by sow parity and by litter size. Why? Because we know, for example, that animals born from first parity sow, so animals that is the first time that they are being moms, tend to be smaller. And we also know, as I explained earlier, that pigs that are born in litters, in litters that are bigger will also have higher percentage of smaller pigs. Mm -hmm. So we want to see, we want to isolate the actual relationship of birth weight and winning weight, excluding as many other possible factors that can be influencing the growth of the animals from now on. So based on that, we end up with 144 pigs uh, to follow them until the slaughter. We, we house them in groups of 12 each, and we had a machine where we can record individual feed intake. So every time they went to eat, we know which pig, and how much that pig ate. So they spent 53 days in the nursery stage, and then we moved them, regardless of their body weight, we moved them to the finisher stage, Well, they remain until they reach around 110 kilos. We were weighing these pigs every two weeks to keep track and try to get right when they were reaching at least this body weight. And we took a note which day they were at that threshold. Okay, so the, I was going to, a few things then uh, cropped up. Uh, the sow parity, just to recap, is the, so a sow will have a number of litters over its lifetime. Is, is the sow parity the, uh, the, the this, you know, the number of litters that a pig has? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like if you say, you know, like a first time mom is a first parity sow. Okay, okay. And as the pit, as the sow gets older, obviously more issues present themselves because just the no, 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 no. As the sow grows older, she just because this is may, maybe it's not the best analogy, but it's the analogy I use, right? Mm. If you have a teenage mom, let's say, or somebody that has a baby very young, yeah, that gear is still growing. Okay. as the right. time that is growing a baby, right? So mm. a first parity sow, let's say, is a very young female that is able to have babies, right? No problem, but it still yeah. has to develop herself a little bit more. Okay. So, so all her pigs, uh, so she will produce maybe one or two pigs less on average than a sow that has already fully developed and that now can concentrate all the nutrients needed for pregnancy in pregnancy. So okay. as, the, as the parities progress, the productivity of the sow will increase until she will reach a peak when it will start to go a little bit lower. The okay. same, you know, as in humans, as the older you get, the less likely you are to have babies. So okay. when, a bit when like, um, I was going to say, my analogy here might be, I, I've looked at the FIFA uh, 19 data set on Kaggle, you know, <laughs> and they talk about the potential. Uh -huh. But if you get a player very young, when they come in at 16, 17, of course, they're very, they could be very good and better than their, than their peers, but their potential, their, the sweet point, if you like, the optimum is when maybe they get up to 27, 28. But then once they get past 31, of course, you, they, um, they, their speed, they slow down. They might still be quite skilled. But so not as bit, they were before. Not as before. Yeah, so, you see, I, I don't okay. understand football. <laughs> Which I should coming from Latin America. From <laughs> uh, so anyway, there is kind of an optimum there as well. Um, yeah. And then there's so an we, optimum. Yeah. No, go ahead. And I was going to say the litter of origin, if the sow, I mean, the, depending, 
you know, the again, the 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 sow can be a, a good sow. I mean, there's obviously there must be variation here. It's not completely standardized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the origin of the pig can be quite can influence okay. the the subsequent performance of the pig. Right, and you're saying if you take the birth weight of the I'm going to call it bonyan, but the piglet, the, mm -hmm. the birth weight of the piglet uh, is, is a predictor of the birth weight at the end, but it's not definitive. The, the yeah. weaning weight actually could provide more information. More, could be well, that's, what we're, well, that, that's what we were trying to answer here. Okay. Should it be the birth weight or should it be the weaning weight? Should it be both maybe? Okay. Or none of the above. <laughs> okay, right. Some other okay. signal, yeah. Yeah. So, so and one with parity, parity is no parity is important, but parity is correlated with birth weight. Okay. So what we were trying to do here is try to isolate the effect of the weight, right, without any other influencing factor. Okay. And that's why we match the pigs. Gotcha. So they have, so those 144 pigs on average now come from the same sow parity from the same litter size. Mm -hmm. So we know that if that is small, has to be for something else. So when, when we are doing the analysis, there's no these extra factors like, you know, okay, this pig is a small, but it was born from a first parity sow, or it came from a litter that has, 15 piglets and not 10 piglets, right? Now we know on average they're equal. And the only thing that is making them different is their birth weight and their winning weight. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So these are two signals that may be able to translate into giving us, you know, you won't have a crystal ball, but perhaps we we're able to, it reveals something then in terms of how quickly the pigs hit this threshold of the 110 kilograms. Yeah, and also okay. think about that when it comes to management, mm -hmm. we always need first parity sows, second parity sows, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. We cannot really control the litter size. We know if a, if a line of sows, like if a genetic kind of sow is more prolific than others, but we cannot control if, if we have 15 pigs or 20 pigs, right? Yeah. We cannot control birth weight, but we can manage those pigs appropriately. Okay. If we, if we know, you know, that some of them can catch up, which ones are those? And okay. then how do we manage them to be able to catch up? And the ones that are unable to catch up, we have to deal with them. We cannot, you know, get rid of 15% of our pigs, mm -hmm. but, but we can provide them with management that suits them better that their requirements are fulfilled, but that also don't cost us a fortune. Okay, yeah. And, and, and therefore the, the producer is able, you know, to have these pigs, they will reach a slaughter at certain point, but it's not, they don't represent an economic loss to them. Okay, yeah. Okay. So efficiency is very important for a whole range of reasons, uh, for the welfare of the animal, for biosecurity, for the quality of the end product. Uh, if you try to bring small pigs up to a certain size and you keep feeding them, then the quality of the food produced is actually inferior. So in many respects, it's very difficult to uh, engineer in solutions without making some kind of intervention mm -hmm. with a call and so on, but it's picking out which pigs uh, have to be culled and being small at birth is not a definitive signal that the pig will be small at the end of the at the slaughter house yeah. yeah at the slaughter time yeah okay okay so once we finished to collect the data we did we had two questions so the first one was can we predict the date that a pig need to reach a slaughter weight so the 110 kilos based on the birth and or their winning weight. And to do that, we use uh, the regression trees in the, and using the R part package in, okay. in R. The second question we have was, 
can we identify peaks that will reach the 110 kilos at 22 weeks of age? And how accurate is our prediction? So to do that, we do it something called receiver operator curves. Yeah. Using the PROC package in R. Okay, right. so, so now, you... yeah, oh. go ahead. So we're going to go into the, the data bit. Um... Okay, maybe we can continue then. I was going to break the video clip, but I think we could continue. Um, yeah. And uh, because you've set up the context and it probably is, uh, it follows directly from. So you're mm -hmm. using our part. So our part is a, a package in our environment here. Our stu we're using our studio. Yeah. And then you're making available, um, of course, Tidyverse and then the ggplot2 package and then that package then for producing uh, the ROC. The okay. Yeah, and we have also the R par plot to make a pretty regression tree. Okay, yeah, important. It, visual, being able to visualize is kind of a, uh, you know, <coughs> what is it? A, a picture is a thousand words, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the first thing, of course, will be to install the packages and to open, um, Sorry, yeah. To, to open in the yeah. environment. Yeah. Yeah. To, okay, so I will set up uh, my working directory to the folder where I have okay. uh, my data set uh, store. And uh, to do that, I just need to use this keyword that is set WD, so set wor working directory. Yeah. And then in quotation, we add uh, the address, the physical address in the computer, right? Okay. Then uh, I want to open my CSV file because I stored it in a CSV. And to do that, I will assign to an object called PIX mm -hmm. uh, my data set and use the command of read.csv followed by the name of my file. Okay. Okay, so once I open that, I can have a glimpse, which is a function from the tidyverse package to know what is inside my data set because otherwise, how do I know what I can do? Yes. So once I run this, uh, I can see down here in the console that I have data for 129 pigs. But mm -hmm. I told you before that I have 144. So what happened with those 15? During the production cycle, we had to remove some animals from the trial because either they got sick, so they need to go to the hospital facilities to get treated. Mm -hmm. um, some of them died. Okay. So, uh, so that's how we lost 15 and we end up with 129. And okay. I have uh, 14 columns representing information for the pigs. So I have the tag that is the individual ID number that we gave them, whether they are male or female, uh, the sow parity, uh, their weight at birth, their weight are at winning, and then we have the total litter size. When you have pigs in the litter, you will have animals that are born alive, mm. animals that are stillborn, so they are born dead. And we also have something called mummified. And mummified are fetuses that died, but at the late gestation, so they are not aborted. They, okay. remain, they remain in uterus. And when they are born, they have this brownish color resembling one of the, you know, like the Egyptian mummies. Okay. And that's what, that's what they are called mummified. Okay. And, that's how, and, the, and the sum of those three components are the liter size. Uh, then we have, well, there was the average daily gain lifetime, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the age at which they reach target is slaughter weight. So at what age they reach the 110 10 k kilos. Yeah. Uh, the total feed intake, so how many kilos of feed these animals ate from winning until they reached 110 kilos, their feed conversion ratio, that is how many kilos they eat for each kilo of meat that they gain, and then uh, which was the actual weight when they reached the target weight, not like when we weigh them on that week. Okay. okay. So when okay. they get to the fifth, after they... Uh, so that the final column represents then 
their final weight, the weight okay. at which they went to slaughter, because we were not weighing them every day. That will okay. be very laborious and very stressful for them. Right. So every, you know, every Monday we were weighing them. If anybody that was at 110 or above were marked to go to the slaughterhouse. Okay. And they, and they were sold. Okay. So now I want to get some really basic statistics just to get a sense of what was the mean birth weight, for example. So okay. if I get the mean birth weight, what I will do is using the tidy birth uh, package, I will just use the data set that we have that is called pigs. And within that, I want to summarize uh, something, no? So I want to do the birth weight. And to this, I will call it mean uh, birth body weight. And that yes. can be any name we want. And then I will call the function mean, the mean of what? Of the birth body weight. So in my data set is called birth underscore body weight. Okay, getting the mean uh, is good, but I also want to see the dispersion of my data. So I will also get the standard deviation and I will just call it a standard deviation underscore birth body weight. And I will call the function SD for a standard deviation for the same variable. Okay. Uh, so if I run this, I can see down here that on average, my peaks were 1.2 kilos at birth plus minus 300 grams. Okay. Okay. So you're getting uh, the first moment and then you're getting uh, the second, you're getting the distribution around the mean weight. Yeah, because then I can see how how small were the small, how big were the big. I can also get the minimum using the same logic. So I just need to call the function min, M-I-N for minimum and M-A-X for the maximum. Okay. And now I can see the full range of, of the birth weight. How will these animals move in? So now I know on average, they were born at 1.2 kilos plus minus a... Uh, 300 grams or 0.3 mm -hmm. kilos. Yes. But I have pigs that were as, as small as 600 grams and as big as 2.4 kilos. Okay. So there. Okay. Yep. So I can do exactly the same for the winning weight, just to get a sense of how were these animals distributed. So when we look at the same. It's the same functions, the same information, but for the winning weight, we observe that on average, pigs were one uh, 5.9 kilos at 28 days of age, so okay. at winning time. Yeah. Plus minus 1.8 kilos, but there were some pigs that were as small as 2.2 kilos. Yeah. So that is even smaller than the maximum birth body weight we have. But we have some pigs that were almost twice the mean, 10.5 kilos at the same age. Remember, these pigs were born at the same time, the same week. Yeah. So there's a huge variability here when it comes, and it's more noticeable at winning than it is at birth. Yeah, I think that sets out probably the, the scale of the problem for a farmer and then involved, if you're involved in this food production that you know, uh, the, the type of uh, production process requires standardization and in terms of what supermarkets and so on, so on want to offer consumers, they want a very standardized product, but then modern nature doesn't deliver, yeah. <laughs> delivers more variation and it's wrestling with that variation then is kind of, uh, kind of. Yeah, uh, what can we do? Yeah. Okay, so now I want to do the same for the, age when they reach the 110 kgs. So if I do exactly the same, okay, I can observe that on average, these pigs reach 110 and 10 kilos at 157 uh, days of age. So around 22 weeks and some days, mm -hmm. uh, plus minus 13 days. But some of them grew so fast that at 135 days, they already reach those 110 kilos. Okay, they made but up the so, gap. Yeah, but some of them went too small, I mean, too slow, that they needed 
202 days. How, okay. So how can I identify those ones that will be 202 so I don't have to delay them? I don't have, you know, how do I manage them properly? Okay. Okay, the next big question will be, are they associated somehow birth weight and winning weight with the age when they reach the target slaughter weight? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to get a sense of what is happening, uh, I will do a graph. Some people like to look at numbers as we just did. Some people like to look at, at graphs. graphs. So if I just try to do the relationship between age and birth weight, I will call the ggplot package. Okay. The ggplot, and then I will write up here the name of the data set. And this is a keyword from ggplot, AES, that stands for aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And first I want to see the distribution in a graphical way, sorry, of the target weight. So I will use a histogram. If I just run this, I get this little distribution. So we can see very lit, very few animals were reaching the target 110 very early. Mm -hmm. Very few also were at the end with the majority around 150 to 170. Now, this may not be very visually attractive so we can actually make it look better, but that also facilitate us to read it. So I okay. will color the bars because this is a very dark color that some people may not be able to distinguish where it finished, where it ends. So I will use the word fill that will color them and I will make them gray, uh, but it's still not great. So I will make, make them even more visible and I will color Color stands for the border. Yes. And I will make the border black. So it's well defined. Okay. So now it's easier to read, it's easier to see. And we we see this was not evenly distributed. Actually, most pigs, as I already said, were around 150 something days to 170. We can make this graph as beautiful as you want. And we can add things like, okay, now here in the in the vertical axis, it says count. And here in the horizontal axis, it says age, target, BW, who knows what it is that. So I can add some commands. Some labels. Some labels, yeah. So I okay. can say the Y axis, so the vertical one, is numbers because it's a count. We are counting number of pigs. Call it, please, frequency. And I want to have it labeled from zero to 30, mm -hmm. because from here I can see now that it should be around 30 in the steps of five. So zero, five, 10, 15. Mm -hmm. And I want the limit to be from zero to 30. Don't make it bigger than that. And I can do exactly the same, but for the horizontal axis. And how do I know that it should go from 130 to 210? Because I already saw before that the range is 135 to 202 days to reach target slaughter weight. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we can also remove the small squares behind because I don't like them. Okay. <laughs> that is the, that the only, like that, yeah. That's the only reason I just don't like them. Okay. Uh, for me, they're distracting. You can keep them. And I can also make the labels in the axis more pretty. This is not necessary. This is just mm -hmm. me being picky, right? Yeah. I can assign the size of the of the font, the color of the font, if I want it bold or not. Mm -hmm. So when we add that, now it's looking more pleasant to the yeah. eye of somebody that may be reading this in a report or in a PowerPoint or something. And if we want to add something to give a little bit more information, because now I know the range, visually I can kind of see where the bulk of pigs, uh, when the bulk of pigs reach the slaughter weight, I can add the actual mean. And I can achieve that by using the function from ggplot, mm -hmm. plot uh, called geon underscore v line, so a vertical line. What do we want in the vertical line? The uh, we want the vertical line in the X axis. So it's a starting in the horizontal axis up. And what I want is the mean 
for the age when they reach the 110 days. I wanted color red because I need that this is really visible. Mm -hmm. I just wanted size 0 0.5, but I want a dashed line. And when I run this, it's very simple now to see the range. So from that uh, here, actually I can make this one nicer. I can put this one by five. So I can see now the actual range is starting at 135 days up mm -hmm. to around 202 with a mean of 157, all in a single graph. Yeah, I mean, that, that's okay. one of the great strengths of the ggplot2 uh, package with relatively, well, you know, you can put a lot of nuance into the graph and, you know, bring out some key features that possibly Possibly we don't really have an Excel. Excel is a yeah. really good uh, tool for you know visualizing data, and that's one of the reasons why people use Excel so extensively. But Tidyverse just brings it to another level. Of course, you've got yeah. to put in a, some syntax, and it, but it's a relatively simple syntax compared to other graphing packages. So I, I like Tidyverse a lot, and ggplot2 in particular. And I think ggplot2 is also available in Python, uh, or there's an equivalent. Yes, it is. It is, yeah. OK. okay so, so it's worth investing. I mean, if, if in terms of data skills, uh, the visualization bit is something that I believe uh, people should kind of look at. You know, it's, um, it's worth investing a little bit of thought into it. And then it enhances the experience then for the reader, the graph. Um, OK. So I'm going to let okay. you continue, Julia. Yeah, so, OK. So sorry. now I want now I do want to check the relationship, if there's a possible relationship right between the age and the birth weight. So now I have two variables that are numbers. Mm -hmm. Birth is numbers and age is numbers. So I will use something called a scatter plot. OK. To call, to call out the scatter plot, we start the same as we started here. GG plot, same start, followed by the name of our data set and the aesthetic keyword. But now I have two variables here. Mm -hmm. I have for x, the age when they reach the 110 kgs. And in the y-axis, I will have the birth body weight. Now, instead of using a geom histogram, mm -hmm. I'm going to use a geom jitter. That will be the keyword for using the scatter plot. And this is just fancy me that I want them size 1.75. You can leave this blank and it will still work. So let's delete for the moment. The default. Yeah. Yeah. So and it will look, it, it will be looking like this. And uh, we can see, or maybe I can see because I know yeah. the data, that it looks to be an association where. As the birth weight is high, is lower, mm -hmm. uh, they will use uh, more time to reach the target weight. Okay. Okay. We can add, as I said, some of these fancier looking uh, options, the same as we did above, that we remove the squares from behind, we add different norm names and, and labels to the graph. Mm -hmm. So now it looks better, but I still maybe if I don't have a trained eye for for checking associations between variables, the ggplot has a function that is called geom smooth. Okay. So we add the geom smooth, and what this does is that it helps us to add a regression line, and now we will see if in fact my presumption that there is a linear association of decreased body weight, higher age is, is possibly there, right? Mm -hmm. So we just need to call here geom underscore smooth method LM is linear model. So it's a linear regression with the formula Y equal X. So if we run this, we have a regression line. Mm -hmm. So now I have hope that I'm not that wrong because this line is going down. So higher birth weight, less time to reach a slower weight. Okay. So it's an inverse relationship. Yeah. And one increase, the... the other one decrease. Yeah. So it, it kind of brings out a little bit your 
your initial suspicions, it confirms in a kind of very visual way, impactful way, what uh, the trend should be. I suppose when you just look at a series of dots, it's like reading uh, the tea leaves and trying to make predictions. <laughs> but if you have, um, uh, if you can, within the, the GG plot, use the re regression lines to, you know, formulate, okay, this is the, the relationship between the variables, you have something a bit more concrete. And then the gray area also suggests, look, there is, um, there's a stronger, it's kind of the confidence around. Yeah. So go very deep into the, the days to slaughter that whitens out or go the opposite direction where the numbers are a bit fewer. Uh, so it's a very nice presentation. It's very revealing. Um, yep. And we can do the same with the winning weight. Pretty much is the same, same um, syntax. The only difference is that here it says winning weight. Okay. Uh, so when we run this, we see very similar result to what we observe with the birth weight. Yeah. So higher winning weight is associated possibly mm. with pigs reaching target slaughter weight sooner than pigs that were win at, at lower uh, winning weight. Yeah, so it looks this, stronger in fact, the relationship yeah, here. Yeah, um, but, but so what this is good is that now I'm not, not doing like a chase that has no meaning, right? Now I know that I can go into the regression trees or the rock curves because it's in, there is in fact a, a possible a strong association here, right? Okay, you have some grounds to suggest, look, I have, set up, I've investigated the data, this initial exploratory side is suggesting I have something I can explore in a yeah. little bit more, okay. And it, it's very simple. We didn't do anything complicated. We got some mean, some standard deviations, minimums and maximums, then we plot exactly the same. And now we have a sense, okay, maybe it's worth my time and effort to go and do something more complicated and this will yield a useful uh, result. Okay, so the first question we had was, can we identify this, uh, no, can we predict, sorry, the number of days that the pigs will need to reach 110 kilos based on their uh, birth weight. So we are going to do some regression trees. Mm -hmm. Why regression tree? Because the, a lot of people call it classification trees, but there yeah. are different things. Regression tree is when your your variable of interest is numeric. So in my case is age, those are numbers. If I was doing a yes and no, for example, or high, low and medium, then they will be called classification trees, but they're okay. exactly the same, okay. the same procedure. We can use the same syntax and I will show you now what is the difference. So the first thing I will do is that I will assign my my regression tree syntax to an object that I will call days to um, to target a slaughter weight. Okay. Okay. One hundred and ten kilos. Yeah. Okay. So first, I need to call out the R part package. So that is the standard keyword that I have to use. So R knows that I'm going to do now a regression tree. Then I will add a my variables of interest. So I want to predict the age at target body weight, 110 kilos. Mm. And I want to predict that based on the birth body weight and the winning body weight. And oh. An advantage, yeah. no, an advantage of the regression trees is that these two variables here, the predicting variables, can be correlated because it doesn't, the regression tree doesn't care if they are correlated. It, it, it has built in, in itself, the ability to deal with collinearity. Okay. Which, which is something I couldn't do if I'm doing a linear regression. In a linear regression, these two has to be independent. It's one of the rules. You have to make adjustments subsequently. Yeah, so I, okay. I yeah. will have to, if I was doing a linear regression, I can only use one of them at the time. Okay. And then I will never be able to know what combination will be the best one to look at an individual pig. But in a regression tree, the regression tree is like, they're all associated, give them to me, I will sort your problem 
Okay. For you, right? Yeah. Okay, so I have that. And then uh, how will it know that it's a regression tree and not a classification tree? I will have to let know the program that it has to use the method ANOVA because, oh. the, because this variable here mm. is a number. It's a continuous numerical number, okay? Right, right. Uh, and I need to say, please get the data from my data set called pigs and run it. Okay. So why it didn't graph? Because I assign it to a object, okay? Yeah, it's, uh, it's in your global environment, of yeah, course. I, yeah. yeah, so peop, some people, as I say, like to see uh, numbers. So for that, you can use the function print this object. Okay. And then we can see that it did certain splits. So it says we have 129 animals. And then at its root, so at the beginning, we have on average 157 days. And then it did all these scripts, uh, split, sorry, that if you like numbers, you can go and read. But some people, as we said before, we will prefer to see it in a nice graphical way. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is to call the R part that plot a package. And then we can we can only use here, w, w, T, S, w, okay? The name of the object and now okay. we have a regression tree. So this okay. section here, Julia, is the uh, machine learning element or it's where we allow the, uh, the algorithm to crawl over the data and to let the algorithm figure out where are the best points to introduce the cuts so that yeah we can, okay right yeah so, so we've so, done our visualization bit which is very important the ggplot tidyverse a very powerful suite of packages that allows to kind of introduce an area and to kind of if we have a hunch explore the hunch but then when we want to see and to allow in a where you sort of a grid search for the these uh, the ages and so on are being split. Uh, this is something that we would like to automate. Our part is a, is a powerful package within R that allows all that to happen. Yeah, uh, and it's giving okay. us, as you say, cut off point. It's not giving us a coefficient like a linear regression will do, right? Yeah. In a linear regression, we get a coefficient that we have to multiply by a factor and then we predict something. Here is, is one line pretty much. And we mm. get a cut of something very specific that we are ready to make a decision with this information. Okay. okay. And it, it, the same information is contained in the console at the bottom of the console as in the, the graph. As is, as is in the graph. Now, okay. this graph is really, okay, it's good. It found some uh, cut off, but at the same time, it doesn't make much sense because it's telling us if winning weight is higher or equal to 3.7 or birth weight is higher or equal to one kilo and then it breaks again in winning weight. Mm. So we can prune like in a garden, we can prune our tree. Okay. And that there are ways to do it with something called the complex parameter. But uh, in this case, because we just have two predictors, we can try first to use some controls. So we say control. Uh, and then we have to write uh, R part that control. And we will say that we want a maximum depth of two branches because we just have two predictors. Okay. It will make no sense to try to have three with one of them repeating. Yeah. So let's see if this works. And we can plot it again. And now we have a tree of only two branches. So how do you read a tree? This is called the root where we have 157 and this will represent 100% of our pigs. Okay. Okay. Then we have the first uh, branch that is called the parent branch. And uh, we have here that uh, our first cut will be given by the winning weight. And the regression trees are hierarchical. So the first one to break in a branch is the most predictive variable. Mm. 
-hmm. So in our case, winning weight has precedent to birth weight. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's the first. Uh, and that, and that, okay. No, and then that's why it's called the parent branch, right? Right. So the parent, our parent branch is given by winning weight at a cutoff of 3.7 kilos. And you see here, these boxes that say yes and no. Mm. So if we have that condition, so we say pigs were winning at 3.7 kilos. Yes. Okay. So that pig will go to a slaughter at 154 days. And those represent 88% of your 129 pigs. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Mm. Now we have like a child branch. Mm. Okay. You win them at 3.7 kilos. Yes. But were they also born at more than one kilo? Yes. And this is because it's the terminal known. Is, you can, but this is the end or it can also be called a leaf because yes. there's no more... There's no more partition after that. So, okay. so these pigs will go to, a slow, to a slaughter or reach the 110 kgs at 152 days. So that is five days below the average. Mm. And they represent 61% of all my pigs. Okay. Now, if they were win at 3.7 kilos or more, but they were born at less than one kilo, they will take 160 days to reach 110 kg. So three days more than the average, eight days more than the bigger pigs. Mm. And they represent 26% of all our pigs. Okay. okay. Now, if your pigs were win at less than 3.7 kilos, there's, it doesn't matter at what, age, at what birth weight they have they will take 177 days, so 20 days more than the average. Okay. And they, and they represent 12% of my pigs. So any pig that is win at more, less than 3.7 kilos is a slow growing pig. Watch up when you win these pigs, move them together to a certain pens, put a label there. Yeah. Because they look they look tiny. How will you know that they're not younger? So put win on whatever day they were born on whatever day and move them together with the other pigs. Uh, maybe they don't need really high protein diet as the fast growing ones. Okay. So speak with your nutritionist, your biggest nutritionist to try to design a diet that will suit them, that they will still have the nutritional needs fulfilled, mm. but that um, reduce the production cost. Also, why is that important? Uh, to label and to know that they are in fact small and not younger because of the veterinarian care. And these animals will need certain, if the, I don't know, if the farm is positive to certain disease, right? They will have a vaccination program. So they need to know when they have to get it. So it's all management. Yes. So th this 12% of pigs will need a specialized management. And that's why we need to identify them. Okay. If that didn't convince you, I can show you also why in money, monetary terms, this is important. Okay. Before you move on, just a few things. Uh, mm -hmm. If you add the 152, the 160 and the 177, you get the total sample. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the percentage is also at the end here, give us yes. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And you're saying that this is the parent division or this is the... What? So the, this here, the 157 is called the root. Yes. These are the parent branches and these are the child branches mm. with the leaf. Okay. Yeah. Or you can call it the different nodes. So the first node, the second node, and then the terminal node. Okay. I, I think it's a very powerful way to visualize the problem. Um, yeah. And because the, it, it's kind of set up, the, 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 our part does the hard work, I suppose, to kind of filter through and figure out what the cutoffs are. I mean, that's a and, big and, help. I, I can't imagine I, us trying to do this in an Excel spreadsheet. I'm no. Sure we could. Yeah, but here it, it, but... Takes, it takes literally two seconds. Okay. 
Well, yeah, in Excel, yeah. it, it may take me a full day to try to figure, to figure how to get it right. Okay. And I, will and I will have to be testing back and forth, back and forth to see what I'm doing is right, no? Right. Here, by, by default, a regression tree will scan all possible data points until it finds the optimal cut. It okay. did all, all that manual work that I will be doing in Excel. It did it for me in five seconds. Okay. So that, that's the real strength of these uh these suites of programs that allow us to you know automate uh, a lot of this type of analysis and come back with quite sensible you know um recommendations in terms of what we should be doing yeah i mean uh the issue then is a, a bigger sample size or something but at, at least you have that number to start off with and you have a strong sense, okay, this is a solution to a classic optimization problem in food production. And it's coming, you know, through a technology that it basically is free, um, you know, the R Studio and R and so on. These are things that a community have kind of put together, if you like, and they're available to anybody um, who's in, in an the advantage field. Is, yeah. An advantage is also that to use a regression tree, you don't need to be an expert in statistics. Okay. Right. Like I said before, right? If I want to do this in a linear regression, for example, I need to know the rules, the statistical rules for how to build a linear model mm. using a linear regression, right? Okay. But he here I don't need that. I can put everything that, that I want to use as predictors if they're related or not, not important. If they follow a linear association with the predicted variable, not important. If the predicted variable is not normally distributed, not important because this is built in a way that it can handle all those constraints that I have in classical statistical models. Okay, it's robust to multicollinearity, it's robust to non-normality, it's yeah. robust to, like, okay, yeah. Like I, I could analyze this through classical statistical approaches, right? Mm. But I need to have, a, to have a very strong knowledge in statistics to know oh. how to handle even this very simple example where, where we have two predictors. This will pose a lot of challenge for me if I want to do it through normal statistical approach. Okay, gotcha, yeah. Okay. So now we can try to translate this into real, a real life situation, right? So the first thing is that all these numbers that we got from the regression tree, we can actually use them to create different outputs. What I will do now is to create a brand new uh, column in my data set. So in the data set that I have already, I will overwrite it and put a different column. So using the tidyverse, I say, I have this data set called pigs, and in that, I would like to create a new data set okay. and to use into, I mean, a new variable, sorry, a new column. And for yeah. that, I use the function called mutate. Eight. I want to call it R3 just because I don't have much imagination to give it a better name. And I will use a conditional statement that is if else. Mm -hmm. So if the winning, weight is lower than 3.7 kilos, please call these peaks as low for me. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Now, if, what did I do? Okay, if they, peaks have a winning body weight that is low, higher or equal to 3.7 N, the bear's weight is higher or equal to one, please call them fast. And as you see, these are exactly the branches that we got right below. Yeah. In below, yeah. So, so 3.7. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, 3.7, okay? Yeah. And then I can do exactly the same uh, for the medium ones, so for the ones that took the 100, um in 60 days okay so you're okay. pulling you're pulling out the population or the the subsets or the subsamples from yeah the, the cutoffs and, that came from the our part 
Yeah, so here okay. I have already three groups. However, if I run this like this, I will get an error. Because okay. I said, right, if this happened, call them slow. If this condition happened, call them fast. And if this one happened, call them medium. But we add it, it's like, okay, but what if none of them happen? What do I do? And that's why we get the error. So I will just say, if none of them happen, call them not applicable. Okay, and so now, otherwise, yeah. Otherwise we get the error that we got here. Okay. So uh, looks like I put a comma or something wrong. Let me just uh, fix it here. Number of brackets opened and closed maybe? No. Yeah, so. So now it, it's okay because we don't get an error. Okay. Okay, now why did I do that? Because now I want to summarize again these di different things that we have in the data set. Remember at the beginning we said we have data of how much feed they ate actually, of what weight they went to the slaughterhouse. So I can summarize my data and say, in this data set that we have called pigs, group them by the R3 variable that we created here. So in the subsets from the regression tree mm -hmm. and give me the mean and the standard deviation for the feed intake and for the weight at which they went to the slaughterhouse. And when we do that, we will see if in fact, or how different these animals are, right? So when we look at here, uh, Okay, so the animals that we call fast, so animals that will come the route all the way going to the left, the one okay. that took 152 days, yep. they ate 214 kilos of feed and they were sent to the to a slaughter at around 114 kilos. Okay. The medium one, so the ones at 160 days, yes. ate to 223 kilos. So uh, nine kilos more, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but they went at the same weight. So looks like we were checking the weights correctly every two weeks. Okay. Yeah. But the slow ones, so the ones that were win at less than 3.7 kilos, they they ate 238 kilos of feed. So that right. is 24 kilo, no, 14 kilos more than the first uh, ones. But they also went at a very similar body weight, one kilo more. Okay. Yeah. So because I work with pigs, I have some information about the average cost of kilo of feed in February this year on average was 31 cents. The average price per kilo of meat paid to the farmer was one euro and 55 cents. Yes. And we know that for each pig, so if they went at 100 kilos, we will get 76.4 kilos of meat because we have to remove, you know, like the organs and that kind of stuff. Yes. So the weight yeah. is reduced and we call mm -hmm. that dressing percentage. I don't know. Okay. 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 So with this information, we can create different columns. So, or, or we can get different information. So in the same so, data set we have. So right, you're putting we, it in a two kind of economics context. Yeah. Uh, because okay. you know, yeah. it's not, it's not so much, only that, oh, I need to give them a, a specific management, right? But if I don't do anything now, if I keep them like this, what will happen to me economically? So I will okay. create a, a variable called feed cost. And to this one, I will say that is the feed intake multiply. So how much they ate multiplied by the cost of ki per kilo that it was 31 cents on average in February. Yeah. I create a new one that will be how much meat I got. So the carcass weight mm -hmm. will be equal to the target body weight multiplied by the dressing percentage that was 76.4. Okay, and that's a, a bit of data that you know the food processor would- Will gi we'll give to the farmer. Okay. Okay, so then we create another one, another variable, that will be the sales. And this one uh, will be carcass weight. So how much meat I actually sold multiplied by the price that in February was 1.55. Okay. Okay. Yep. And then I will create one last one that will be a margin overfeed because I don't know which were the fixed costs, right? So these animals stay 
stay longer in the farm, but I don't know how much it costs to house them, let's say, per day, okay. right? Or if, there is if, lighting and there is other things being... Water, labor, uh, yeah. labor exactly. Uh, okay. I don't know the cost for the animal health, you know, like the health care that yeah. the farm... But So let's just call it margin overfeed. So, okay. so this will be sales minus the feed cost. Okay. Feed cost, okay? So we're underestimating the true cost for some yeah. of them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now I will group this by the R3 uh, variable that I created before. So by the subset of the tree. And then I will summarize, but we'll get the means of uh, the mean feed. And this will be the mean feed cost. So this will be mean uh, feed cost. Mm. Then I can get the same, I will just copy it here, the mean uh, for the sales. And I can also get the mean margin overfeed. Let's see if this runs, okay? So when we come and look at here, the fast growing pigs are the ones that reach 110 kilos at 152 days. Yeah. Cost me, or feed cost, 66 euros. While the slow growing pigs cost me 73.8. So they were costing- A, a bit more. Yeah, like six euros. Mm. 7.6 euros extra, okay? Only Plus, in feed. Okay. Okay, when it comes to sales, because we were sending them to a kind of a standard um, body weight, they produce a similar amount of sales. So 135 for the faster ones, 134 for the medium ones, and 136 mm -hmm. for the slow ones. When we check the margin over feed, so this will be kind of the gross margins. The fast growing ones uh, will make for me 68.7 uh, euros, mm -hmm. while the medium ones will make 65, and the slow ones is 62.3, which okay. is a, a difference of 6.4 uh, euros extra. Yeah. So imagine if we had a batch of 100 pigs, of 1,000 pigs, that will be more of a real commercial farm. Mm, so what yeah. if we have 1,000 pigs, okay? So we know, or we said, right, that the slower pigs will represent 12%. So this will be, a, I don't know why they're saying it. Oh, I know, I'll do it here. 120. Yeah, but I was hoping that it was going in the normal area does it anyway. So uh, this will be yeah, 120 pigs, right? Okay. So if I have 120 pigs and I'm losing uh, 6.4 euros, so 6.4 times 120, that will be 768 euros. Mm. lost um, in the uh, slow growing pigs. And that is just lost associated with the extra cost of feed. Yeah. So it's it's substantial. It's a, and again, it's kind of, a, it's a major challenge then for somebody who was producing uh, meat. But then I presume also those slower growing pigs also produce I think you were saying before, the meat is not the same quality. Exactly. So then they may get paid even less than we would have estimated. Okay. So imagine if you are losing 768 euros a week. Yeah. If you do that a year, you will be losing 47, four, sorry, 479,232 euros per year. Okay. So... It has a huge bearing then in terms of how sustainable uh, a business is. And this is something then that requires a set of steps, but 
it has to be i'm sure every uh pig producer has a set of yeah um you know a decision tree in their head if you like what i have to do under certain circumstances but um again i think it would be useful if you know there was a if you can set it up as a problem like this and communi communicate it visually here is a simple set of um, you know, this is what you stand to lose if we take these values that uh, are static, they're commercial values, values that represent the cost of feed, uh, the, the uh, potential profits that are built in, how much of your profits otherwise have to be absorbed if you have uh, these slow growing pigs, and then what are the set of steps then that should be introduced and at what point that you make your business more sustainable. And of course, yeah. the longer the longer those pigs are then in the uh, that have to be produced, then the more we didn't take account of pollution. Uh, costs. Yeah, we well, I mean, know. yeah, for some for some of them, we may be overestimating the cost for mm. some of them. We may be overestimating, underestimating. Right. But the point is that if we do nothing yeah. to appropriately manage these pigs, we can lose a lot of money because maybe, you know, when we start to design proper management practices for this group of the 12%, we will need to invest on money, right? Okay. You know, yeah. But, but still, we have to do something because otherwise we are losing money, a lot of money every year, yeah. every week. Well, you, 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 I think you were saying before you might have to put them into a separate pen and then maybe you have to modify the production the, unit and the all yeah. in, all out batch production then is a bit compromised and then you have the issues yeah. around disease. So it's a very interesting, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought me through this um, because, uh, well, well, first of all, it kind of, uh, how, in a very practical sense, how can machine learning actually help in the decision-making process? Not everybody would see the connection there, but there are these connections. And if we can set up these models, I think they could be very fruitful then in you know providing guidance. And that's exactly what Tagish has been set up to do. Yeah. And um, in the DIFME project, um, uh, we were trying to, part of the, um, Thinking is how do we set out, uh, um, you know, tools that people could use that are useful in terms of um, building up their digitization skills, um, and then I think R is an absolutely fabulous R studio. Uh, the different packages contained within R, which are mainly coming from academia, in fact, mm. uh, these actually are very important. Then, and if we can utilize them. Uh, um, it's really great. Uh, you've also, in a very selfish way as well, I'm very happy you went through this with me. This could, uh, my teaching uh, could be assisted here for the next <laughs> years, right? Um, because sometimes people are not quite believing. And if you're doing kind of a Titanic data set or whatever, they it's difficult sometimes when you have a, a kind of lay audience or not uh, completely, who are unfamiliar, let's say, with data science, okay, well, in the real world, how can these models be something that uh, have a value proposition? So if I set out to learn something, how then can I apply them in a way that adds value to an employer or in my own business? And of course, uh, you know, uh, when something is free like R or the Google Colabs and so on, um, these are resources that can easily scale. So if you build them in as an extension to whatever, I mean, you have to can build your data because uh, you, you're recording uh, the animals and so on, or you're recording units of production. But to go from that, from your Excel to a CSC file, to then bring into an R environment or Google Colab, that doesn't have any uh, major costs other than the cost of actually going off and learning it right that's yeah that's the thing and if we can provide tools that assist people in learning that's great um that's a uh, i found this very useful and i found it very interesting uh and i'm also it's sometimes nice to come across people who actually uh have the expertise that can share it not every expert is willing to share right that, that sometimes <laughs> is the problem 
and to find somebody, Julia, that's um, uh, that's willing to do that, I think that's very uh, generous on your part, and uh, really delighted that you you actually. Um, uh, no, I'm, I'm glad that you invited me to do this because, you know, I can do all of this or more complicated stuff, but if if they stay with me or with within us in Chagas, is useless. Yeah, it has to find a home and the exactly. Home, yeah, if it's you know we. We publish papers and that's great, but maybe it's not the scientist like you and me that should be reading this. It should be a farmer, a pig producer elsewhere that can use this, a similar thought process to optimize their operations. Yeah, I, I, I mean that the, we create artificial labels like experts sometimes. It's not really true. It's a question of did you manage to just integrate into your analysis. I mean, for some people uh, making the step into Excel and using Excel, uh, that constitutes a form of expertise, which it is, but we sort of create boundaries when we refer to people as being experts. And probably yeah. we should encourage people just to embrace and engage a bit with these technologies. And because they are technologies that are largely just sitting there in, on, you know, in repositories on the internet, uh, whatever we can do to kind of open it up a bit, I think that uh, that's important. I think also from the Tuggish perspective, this is something that they obviously would see huge potential in that you share these models with farmers and you, you give them enough time. Obviously they're busy doing things, uh, but if they have a moment to reflect a bit on strategy, this would be something I'd like maybe that they could. Uh, we have a, in. We have a monthly newsletter, so we try to write all this kind of stuff into more like a normal people friendly, let's say, yeah. and yeah. a producer friendly language. And we, we always try to disseminate this to the farmers. Yeah, I see. I was jumping the gun. Do you want to take a crack then at the RSC curves? If you want, I was going to ask if you okay, still yeah, want maybe. to do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I try to go a little bit faster with this. So the second question we had was, can we really, how accurate do we, can we identify this group of pigs that will go at the 20 weeks, right? Yeah. So the first thing we have to do will be to create a new, a new variable where we classify them as yes or no. So it's the same uh, process. So, so that now, just now I will make it like a, let's say a permanent variable in the data set, not only play as I was doing before. And I will use the mutate in this case, I will call it target body weight at 22 weeks. So if they reach it less than 124, say yes, otherwise, I mean, say one, otherwise it's zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to make now a table of how many of those uh, were classified as such. So 67 didn't reach on time, let's say, and 61 from the 129 peaks reach uh, the 110 kilos by um, 22 weeks. Okay. Uh, th then uh, I will do it using birth body weight as a predictor. And the first thing we need to do is to fit a logistic regression uh, uh, okay. yep. model, sorry. So I will assign it to something called bvw.fit just because I want to call it that way. And I will use a GLM, so a generalized linear mix model with the target body weight, yes or not, being predicted by birth weight from the data set peaks. And because this is zeros and ones, we're using the binomial distribution. So we fit that, it runs no problem. And then we will draw the rock, the rock curve. So to do the drawing, uh, I will assign it to another object, uh, just because I want to play it then after with it. And uh, I will call out the function ROC from the PROC package. And I will say in the data set called peaks, there's a variable called target BW underscore 22 weeks. And in, the, in this object, BBW.fit, I have the fitted values for the logistic regression. Please plot this for me and use um, the legends that you already have and give me uh, the results. So when we do this, uh, we get a curve, 
that is called o a receiver operated curve. Mm -hmm. And in the ax, uh, so here you see a line like a diagonal, yep. and that is like 50%. If you get your curve just right there, that means that this is not accurate. You are not predicting anything. We cannot identify, we cannot predict the peaks that will reach at 22 weeks. The specificity in the horizontal axis is will be defined as the true positive. So okay. the peaks that were classified correctly as reaching the target slaughter weight at 22 weeks. And the specificity are the true negatives. So the ones that were classified correctly as not being 110 kilos at 22 weeks. Okay, so yeah. now I need to, to know how good is this prediction everything below the curve um, is calculated. So what is the area below okay. this curve? And that is how it's called, the AUC or area under the curve. So we use exactly the same, the same as before, the same um, syntax as before. I am just uh, uh, assigning it to vectors. We don't have to, but because I want to compare it after with the birth body weight, with the Winning body weight, sorry. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, called the ROC function in the data set peaks is the variable with yes or no. In the fitted one, we have the, fit, the fitted variable for the logistic regression. And I want that it prints, this is the only difference. I want that it prints the area under the curve. So once we do that, it's telling us that below this curve, so all this area here is 72.4%. And when we read the AUCs, anything, so anything that is uh, below equal to 0 0.5 is non-accurate. 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 is less accurate. Mm -hmm. From 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 is moderately accurate. From 0 0.9 to 0 0.99 is highly accurate and one is perfect. Okay, so based on this, when we predict a uh, how good it will be our prediction based on uh, on birth body weight is not that great, is uh, moderately accurate. And this can be due because we have very few peaks and we matched them before, right? So mm -hmm. we already eliminate some of that variability. Uh, if, I wa if I don't like this curve, I can make it prettier and I can use the smooth function from the, uh, the PROC package assigned to the subject here and I okay. wanted to look, uh, I assigned it there and then I plot it. I need to plot that. I want to add it color red because it's more visual. Yeah. And if it, this was a perfect curve, it will look like that, but like that, that is just that is just aesthetics. Yes. Uh, now I know that using birth body weight, I will be able to predict uh, around 72% of peaks, out of which 63% um, will be true positives and 81%, I believe, will be true negatives. Mm. So now I need to know what is the cutoff value. So for the cutoff, we will plot it and we will call the function plot.roc uh, from the peaks uh, data set, use the variable yes or no, and plot the birth body weight. I want the thresholds. The best threshold mm -hmm. is the one that I want. The one that is that has the highest sensitivity and highest uh, specificity. Okay. And then if we do that, it's telling us that uh, to to identify peaks based on the birth body weight, I will need to look for peaks that are born at 1.1 kilos, and those are the ones that in 70 uh, that you know our prediction is 72 percent good, with a sense with a sensitivity yes of 80. Wait, what the numbers before the? I can go back here. Sorry, here. So it will be with a so with a specificity of 63.5. So 63.5% of the times we will uh, identify through positives mm. and 81% of time we will identify through negatives. And we can repeat exactly the same 
the same uh, method, but using the winning weight. So first we do the logistic regression. After the logistic regression, we fit the receiver operate, operating curve. Then we plot this to get the uh, area under the curve that in this case is a little bit lower than if with the winning weight. And then uh, we look for the, sorry here, we look for the threshold at, um, at winning, that in this case is 6.7 uh, with here, with a, a with these sensitivities and specificity. So in our case, our prediction is not really robust, but we believe that is because we have really few uh, peaks. So the sample the size of, is, is small with 100. Yeah, so, yeah. 129, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay, so if we want to compare now, which one is better than the birth weight or the winning weight, we can compare them using the function ROC uh, test. And we just fit here, we just put the curves for the birth body weight and for the winning body weight. And it will give us here a comparison. So first we will get a P value so anything that is higher than 0 0.05 means that they are pretty much equal. So ours is, is 0 0.05, yeah. So our here is 0 0.59. So there's no difference in both curves. Mm. Yeah. And we can use either if we want. You see, we get here some warnings, but it's also because we, you know, we don't have that many uh, pigs. But there are warnings that are not errors. Okay. Uh, so, uh, which one can you use? Either of them, none of them are great really when it comes to identify the peaks that will come uh, to reach the slaughter weight at 22 weeks. Maybe to say it's not great, it's not the best, but they're not the most accurate okay. based on our population. Pigs could be born small, but then there could be fast growers. Exactly. So okay. So and the, yeah, and then the only thing is that in most farms, farmers will be weighing pigs at winning. Okay. So, so they could use that threshold of 6.7 and they will reach uh, the target weight at 22 weeks. So it's yeah. just pretty much two methods that people can use to answer a similar question. Yeah, I, I kind of understand why weaning would be preferred, even though it involves more work, obviously uh, weighing pigs when they get that little bit older. Yeah. Uh, but they... You know, you have a kind of more up-to-date data set. You know, if you if you're trying to make a prediction in terms of uh, where they are at maturity, in terms of the kilo weight uh, after X number of days, uh, the weaning uh, weight is a closer. You know, you a certain number of things might have happened between. Uh, between when the piglet is born until the weaning period that wouldn't be picked up in the we in the in the birth weight. Yeah. So you have more information contained uh, in that weaning. But the two offer both interesting signals. Um, and again, figuring out, you know, how you can introduce both or strategies that might be used to figure out. Again, the practicalities around weighing animals at birth. Um, is very difficult. Also difficult. imagine if you have, let's say, I don't know, 50 sows or whatever number farrowing at the same time, yeah. pretty much you have to sleep there to be exactly. able to, to, to weigh every single pig as soon as, as it's being born. And I'm sure some people do uh, engage at that, those kind of all-nighters and that goes on. But also the, the, the sow is very, at birth, I think the sow can be very, uh, not aggressive, but protective yeah, of the of newly the born. Piglet. So you yeah. start messing around weighing it and so on, then you're introducing new smells and so on to the piglet. So the weaning makes sense, I suppose, uh, just I as suppose. a practical matter. Yeah. yeah, and it's more practical. So then maybe, you know, see, only to finish this up. Yeah. If so, if somebody wants to read more about this study and what else we did, because we did more things, this was published last year. It was okay. it's part of the thesis of one of our PhD students. And you can find it in this link. Yeah. Or you can send me an email and I can send 
send you their paper. Yeah, and you're quite a, quite a prodigious uh, producer of research, uh, which is great to have somebody in Ireland that's, and your <laughs> colleagues who are producing this level of research uh, and yeah. to have that expertise. And yeah. uh, I'll leave a link then. This will go out as a YouTube clip. We'll link it into the DIFME network, okay. uh, DIFME Erasmus network. Uh, we'll link in some of the papers you might suggest that might be useful reading where you have some of these exercises set up. And then the code, uh, how should we manage the code? Can I link it in? Can we? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, in the data set that I gave you, yeah. Okay, we'll make available then the code, a lot of, uh, because there's also an audience beyond Europe, in fact, in India and other uh, jurisdictions um, and you know, you know it, they find it, it, this interesting too. There's a bigger community uh, here sometimes yeah. than what we perceive. And, and it's not, you know, sensitive data. It's not something like a product we were using. As I said, this has been already published. So it's, it's out in the open. Okay, so complete transparency, which is great. Yeah. Well, just again, Julia, to thank you one more time for all the work here. Uh, and this is the fruit of many people. It's a lot of hours when I do it, a paper, I just download a data set from Bloomberg or from Reuters, or maybe some of it can be hand collected, but uh, a lot of the time a data set just falls into your computer with a click, whereas this data set is something that is we have, we have to, Yeah, we have to spend a lot of time in the farms to gather the data we need. So, so this yeah. data set is, is collected at a lot of cost. It's not a data set. So again, that's also something that uh, we're yeah. thankful for. So it's a little maybe, bit precious, the data. Yeah, maybe just to, see, to finish, I just want to say that pig production is very complex and people don't realize that sometimes. And some minor improvements can result in very important increases in production and in profits mm -hmm. in the farms. Yep. Farmers already gather or create a lot of data in pig farms on a single day. And sometimes they don't realize of the enormous amount of data they have. So if we, these kind of sessions are really good for them to realize that and to learn techniques that can make them to, to use it in a better and more efficient way to improve different aspects of their production. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think some of this is state of the art as well. So uh, it's for both, hopefully we can introduce this environment to uh, the kind of um, people at production level, but also maybe uh, other experts in the field who have to get the message out. Uh, this opens up also kind of a vista for them to look at you know, uh, what work has been done and then how do they communicate, whether it's in other European jurisdictions or um, elsewhere. So again, it's just a thank you very much. Um, and we leave the links then uh, below. There'll be hyperlinks we'll include along with the video clip. We'll leave those uh, below uh, the video clip so people can peruse at their own leisure. And I'll try to go through the video clip and set up also stubs so people can track it. So if they just want to see the code element, not so much the discussion, so on, they can <laughs> then uh, figure out, or if they just want to look at the, oh, the AUC or the ROC, so on, we okay. set up such a way that they can accelerate access to those. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop the video he here. I'm just going to pause and thank you again.